AI app builders and especially vibe coding platforms are exploding in popularity. And the one thing that stands out in the messaging is that you don't have to have any technical skills and you can simply create the app of your dreams with just a simple prompt. And money talks. Many of these companies have multi-billion dollar valuations and people who are creating content in this area, it's simply easy for them to carry on this perception that you can just simply use a single prompt and create this awesome website or make a very simple to-do list app. But for those of us who spend our full-time jobs building apps, the reality is a little bit different. Yes, we get so much value from the initial build, but it still takes a lot of prompting, a lot of coaxing, and there's still a number of things that LLMs just aren't awesome at. So in this video, I wanna walk you through an app that I've been building and talk about the areas that are going really well and other things that simply took a lot of time because hopefully we can get to a point where we have more open and honest conversations about these platforms rather than simply pretending that they're magic. My company at Automation Helpers focuses mostly on creating internal apps for businesses as opposed to brand new MVPs or websites. Now, if you're interested in learning about the functionality of this app, I encourage you to check out our other video where we walk through that more in depth. Now, I think you'll find a lot of the things I talk about in this video are relevant to other AI building platforms, this one in particular that we're talking about today is called Zite. Zite is my favorite platform to use right now because it makes the process a lot easier if you're building internal apps for your company. They handle user authentication, databases, workflows. It's really a lot more than just other platforms that really focus on the front end building. So let's talk about how we got started with this app. So I did put in an initial prompt here where I got kind of specific about how I want the actual inventory tracking process to work. I talk about how we have boats, so we actually are tracking kind of this serialized inventory, but then we also have things like paddles and life jackets, which we want to be able to track in our inventory as well. I talk specifically about how we want this rental form process to work and how we want people to be able to check out inventory for certain segments of time within a day. And then we include some basic instructions of an admin experience that we want in a dashboard. Now, people will argue a lot about the perfect prompt to get started with an app. For me, I found the right balance to be something kind of in the middle. You get granular enough to feed some opinionated ideas into the LLM, but we don't get so in the weeds that it gets hung up on specific details. And instead we want to get the initial bones, the initial structure of our app. I find it helpful to go to Claude or ChatGPT to feed in some initial ideas that I have, to have it structure it for me so I can then feed it into the AI app builder. So when we fed in those instructions, I was able to get the whole navigation of the app already built. It chose the way that this look, it built my dashboard for me, all these different tabs that we have along the top. It created all of this with a single prompt. So that initial feeling is great. It took about five minutes to generate this entirety of the app, but this part is just the beginning. And what we find for so many other tutorials is that they don't dive deep into what actually works and what doesn't work in the application. So the first thing that worked really well is that in Zeit, it created all of our workflows for us automatically. So it wasn't just a nice looking front end. Instead, it's making the actual API calls to our database to say, hey, we need to retrieve boats. We need to get rentals. We need to create rentals. And it creates all of this very visual logic for us so that we can step in and actually see this from a visual standpoint as opposed to kind of being in this black hole. The other thing that it did is it created the necessary database tables for this to actually be structured on the back end. So the first feature I needed to dig into was the actual form for the rental process. Now, initially when it created the form, it created one super long form and I wanted to split this into multiple pages. Now, splitting this into multiple pages was done easily. It didn't get confused by the logic to do so. And the system was smart enough to understand, hey, I might have situations where we want to enter a new customer for the first time and have it create a customer record on the back end, or to be able to choose from our existing customers and to load them in so that we could select them. Let me go back in time to our very first version so you can see what this looked like. It snuck in this gradient theme, which I absolutely hate, but it was my bad for not seeing it. I had to restore this later. But let's take a look at that rentals. And here's that run on form I was talking about. So up here, we can't really scroll through our form. We can choose from our boats here, but that actually didn't work, the functionality. And then here, we've got our rental period. And I really didn't like this user experience. So for example, I could enter in the date and I did have a time picker 
but we're never going to choose down to the minute amount. So this feels like a really not great experience if we plug that in. And then if we do the end date, well, assuming we're doing single day rentals, now I have to enter the information again, and then this still isn't contextualized, so I have to manually set this myself. So I didn't really care for that kind of experience. Instead, I wanted to simplify this. So going back to the current version of the application, now we've got that customer picker, and look, instead we can choose the date, choose a start time, which I had it configure our own business logic around the hours of operation. So I said, we're open from eight to five, and I wanna go by half hour increments, so we can book that time. And then instead of having an end date and an end time, much easier just to say, hey, we're gonna book it by the hour or book it by the four hours in a day. Now this initial information I did have in my initial prompt, but it didn't really do anything with that information. So instead, I find it more helpful to break it down feature by feature to actually build this out. So at this point, I've been able to build new features. This iterating on the form and adding those new features probably took around 30 minutes. Now, the first time that the LLM really started to have issues was when we get to this next feature, which is to talk about when we're actually selecting the boats. So here I updated the styling and that part looks nice, but it was never actually able to tell me which boats are available at a given time. And that's because despite common sense, despite my initial prompt, when we were on my boats table, it had a field called is available and it was a checkbox. And so these systems by default don't really necessarily go through the logic of determining what should really happen there. They say, oh yeah, you wanna see if it's available? Great, we'll add a checkbox to see is available. And the problem, of course, is that a boat is not always available or always unavailable. It's not a static status. And so I wanna walk you through the progression of the conversation of the prompts that I had with the LLM. So first, I wanted to give it a chance. I wanted to go kind of high level and say, hey, on the second page of that form, only display the available boats to choose from as active, meaning the boats that don't have a rental during the time that we already selected on the first page then we're going to gray out the boats that are unavailable and we just have the ones that we can rent. So I want to go high level from more a product manager standpoint, explain what I'm looking for as the feature and then have the LLM do the work for me. And of course, LLMs are overconfident and it's like, yep, I built it all for you. Well, when I got to that page, then none of the boats were available. They were all unavailable despite no bookings happening during that time. And this is where for the first time it recognized, oh yeah, in our database and in the code, we have this static availability status as opposed to us actually using the code that you told us to build. We're still relying on that old logic. So try it again. It failed. At this point, I manually deleted that field because we don't need it. And then I started to get more specific about the API call and how we needed to filter it based on the data from the first page. Well, then it turns out, despite that field being deleted about the is available, it still had that somewhere buried in the code. And so at this point, we essentially had two fragmented pieces of code, one that's presumably doing it the right way and one that's looking to this field that no longer exists. But then after we resolved that, it still wanted to create really more complex backend logic by querying each boat at a single time. And from a performance standpoint, that would be terrible. Because imagine if you have like 20 different boats and now you need to grab each one of those boats and grab each set of rentals for each one of those boats. There's no reason we need to make 20 different API calls for that. Instead, we should just query what we need, pull it back, and then calculate based on that. So then with my prompting, I had to get very technically specific about what exactly that I needed because talking in generalities or talking in product features wasn't working. So I needed to tell it very specifically that as the user moves from the first page to the second page, then we need to actually prompt this pull back the boats, grab the boat IDs, and then we need to compare it against the data that we get back from the rentals. That still didn't work, so I started to get a little bit angsty. I said, all right, you're not getting it. I need to have the date, start time, end time. This is where I'm now asking it to do console logging. I want it just to print what information it has into the console, into my dev tools, to be able to compare this information myself. Is the issue that we're not retrieving the data correctly? Is it that we're retrieving data, but it's the wrong data? Is it the comparison logic that's not working? What is it about this process 
that's not functioning. Well, then we have issues on what's actually getting logged to the console and what does it need to trigger on? Is it triggering when I actually click to the next page or what do I have to do to print that information to the console? And so we try again just to get the information to print. We still don't know what the core issue is. We're just trying to get the information so that I can make the determination on my own. So I finally get it to log the information to the console and then I find that I'm getting this empty array back. And so in reality, it's saying that all my boats are unavailable and it should be the inverse logic. Now, if any human was looking at this, this would make sense. But the system didn't understand that. So we had to specifically tell it to invert the way that it was doing the logic. At last, we were able to get it to actually determine which boats are available. So I know this is kind of a lot of information so far, but for an equipment rental management system, actually managing the rentals and seeing what's available that is the core business logic to the entire system. And while our initial prompts took just a few minutes to get something that looks pretty nice on the screen, it took about 45, 50 minutes to work through all of the business logic to actually make it check for the rentals. And I say this from the perspective of someone who can code. I can go into the code and identify what's actually going on myself. So if I had no technical chops, and I had to rely exclusively based on what I'm getting from the LLM, that's why so many people get so frustrated. They are told by this very overconfident system, yep, I made the change and it's all good, you're all set. When in reality, we know that this is not necessarily accurate. So being able to have a conversation and dig deeper both into the code as well as getting these feedback loops so that we can get information back so we can understand the issue ourselves is hugely imperative. Now, at this point, we had gotten the logic to work, so it grayed this out for us, but I didn't actually have this availability time. And I thought, oh, this would be kind of helpful to see because if we could put those times, we could suggest to our customer, hey, we can get you a different boat, or if you want to come back in a couple of hours, then I can rent this to you. But I realized that we had some time zone issues because now if I was booking at a different slot, it was looking at my current time. I'm in US Central and it's comparing it to UTC time. And so we had this mismatch going on. So even though I thought I had all the business logic worked out, we still had this time zone issue. And if you've developed a product before, you realize that time zone issues and how we handle dates and times, they've been a problem since forever. We've created all of these JavaScript libraries to help us better deal with time. Well, now we're trying to explain this to a system of like, hey, uh, you got most of the logic, but you're still not handling the times correctly. So then I had to uncover on my own, oh, in the database, it's using UTC, which is fine. It can store it as UTC, that's fine. But on the front end then is when it was using my local time zone. So that's how we had that mismatch. So I had to decide at that point, okay, well, am I going to convert this to my time zone? I did because I assumed if we were just a local shop, we could just have it in our own local time zone. Or are we going to update the front end? So I made the change here, but then what needed to happen is we had to refactor the whole application because of simply changing our settings on this field. So if I came into edit field and I changed my uh, time format with the time zone, then that messed up how that code was actually running to check and make that comparison to see when the rentals were available. So in addition to building the initial logic, just dealing with time zones and time zone refactoring took another half hour. So after all that said and done, remember this logic was to help us with our serialized inventory. For these specific boats, now we could determine the actual rental times for those. But when it comes to accessories, this is a different story. Like we talked about earlier, if we have life jackets, we have a fixed quantity that's available. I don't actually care about the specific ID of which life jacket is being rented out. I just want to make sure that I have enough on hand and they're getting checked back in. And again, back in the database, the LLM had initially wanted to take the path of least resistance. It didn't want to actually help me calculate how many life jackets were available. And the reason I could tell that is because we had total quantity available, but then we had another static field which said available quantity. So it said eight out of 10 or seven out of 10. But that doesn't work in a real production system. Because again, we're not asking about the quantity for all of time. We're talking about the quantity available 
for this point in time. So tomorrow, midday, I might only have five life jackets available, but today I have all 10 of them available. And so then I needed to manually create a brand new rental accessories table where we could book a number of quantities. So we could say, oh, I actually wanna have two life jackets or three or four, we could book multiple at a time. This is essentially a line items table. So we said, okay, our main rental agreement here, now we have rental accessories on top of it, and we can connect it to the accessory and the quantity that we want. And that was just a structure actually being able to check out multiple of a thing at a given point in time. That didn't even begin to handle the actual inventory management to check and query, do we actually have the right number at this point in time? So all that logic took about another 45 minutes to specify this is exactly how we want to handle the process of renting accessories. And then the last part that I want to mention is just around the styling, the CSS of things. So a lot of AI app builders default to certain frameworks and certain libraries that they use just out of the box. Zeit and many others rely on this Shad CN, which looks pretty nice, especially if you're building tools and dashboards. But man, for me to actually change the theme from that ugly gradient that I had back to a standard just blue took way longer than I thought. There is a feature to allow me to change the theme, but that was blocked for some reason when I was on the gradient theme and I had to instruct it manually. And then it's got CSS styles all over the place, so it doesn't actually apply it uniformly. And this issue of just getting paid to be green instead of red has already taken about four prompts and we're still not there. Again, if I take the developer route and go and find and hunt the classes themselves and figure out why the wrong class is being applied or whether something's overriding it, I can do that. But if we're supposed to be able to actually vibe code, then we don't wanna to have to do this ourselves manually. We just want to be able to rely on the system to do it for us. So the message behind all of this is not that vibe coding and AI coding tools are bad. They're amazing. The fact that I could build this rental management system in about three hours is great. But don't get sucked into the hype that you can build your perfect application in a single prompt. And if you're really interested in building on your own skill set, you're naturally going to become more technical over time. You might not write a bunch of code, but you're going to understand a lot more concepts than previously. So this whole idea of being totally non-technical and using a couple magical prompts to flesh out your whole application it's a little bit overdone. If you have any questions about building your own internal applications or systems, don't hesitate to reach out to our website at automationhelpers.com where we're offering free consultations.